putting up uh, such a nice such a nice conference um so let me get rid of this okay so uh this is the title of uh, my talk and i take it as a little bit of an opportunity to reflect on my own research trajectory for the last few years so the first thing I want to uh, say is thank you to uh, my collaborators. Uh, there will be more along the talk, but these people have been uh, involved uh, directly in the in the things I'm going to tell to you today. So uh, thank you very much to all of them. And let me tell you how this uh, story of mine begins. It starts here in, in Mallorca in 2004. In this conference, which uh, with the help of uh, our chairman, I have uh, uncovered from the archaeological records. Uh, this was a conference, a very small workshop organized by uh, Maxi with uh, Peter Richman, who led a cost action at the time. And it was, to me, the beginning of, uh, of my uh, research line on social things. So, in fact, after that uh, conference, I published my first paper on, on behavior. And uh, yeah, to me, it was like the, the beginning, but it's more than that. It's like I, I've carried with me uh, the talk Nigel Gilbert gave at this small workshop. And there is, uh, again, with the, with the help of uh, Maxi, uh, the slides Nigel presented. And uh, I remember, as it were today, uh, his words on uh, second order emergence, which is the topic of my talk. In fact, he defined a second order emergence as the fact that uh, the emergent behavior on a complex system feeds back on the individual components of that complex system. Okay, so it's to me, it's uh, making a physicist analogy. It's a little bit like general relativity. Bodies deform the space, and that this deformation of the space brings bodies together or apart. So this is the same kind of a story, and that's what Nigel said. These structures. This, this emergent phenomenon are the matrix where the action of the components takes place. <laughs> and I hope that during my talk, I will make this uh, more clear. And I'm going to focus mostly on social norms as the paradigmatic example of a second order emergence. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to cover in, in, uh, in my talk these topics, uh, what are social norms, how they are emergent phenomenon, and then how can you understand social norms as uh, the drivers of behavior? <clears throat> Time permitting, I will also discuss briefly uh, other example, which is uh, culture and social structure, how culture modifies the structure of our relationships. So uh, I've been doing this for, uh, thinking of this for a while, and this was my first contribution. Uh, and I'm uh, glad to see Frank uh, down there in the audience. Nice to see you again. And uh, this was my first paper on this in 2013, but it was still uh, very much inspired from the physics side. So all uh, social norms are doing there in the last term in this uh, function you see there is the fact that you feel less satisfied if there are less people following the norm or more satisfied if they are. But that was still very, uh, a very uh, toy model approach. I'm going to add some <clears throat> So uh, later I came to learn how uh, people in the social science discuss social norms. And this is a, a very nice uh, summary of uh, how people define social norms. I do encourage you to read them. I copied an, ex an excerpt uh, there. I don't expect you to read it. I will uh, explain in a minute what I'm going to do. But basically, if you want to uh, do something with social norms, you should be looking at a clear definition of what you're going to uh, study, okay? So in my case, uh, I adopted the approach by uh, pioneer by Christina Vickeri, who is also depicted there. And uh, she defines norms as shared rules of behavior. And if I say share, I mean there's a reference group, there's a collective that shares these uh, social norms. <coughs> Excuse me. And then social norms consist of expectations. 
And there are two types of those. There are empirical expectations and normative expectations. So empirical expectations, as their name says, uh, mean what I think the rest of my reference group are going to do. Not what they think, what they do. And then you have to consider normative expectations. And that is a little bit more convoluted. It's what I think the people in my reference group think I should be doing. Okay, so what they think I should do. Okay. Uh, on top of that, everybody has its own, his or her or, uh, personal normative beliefs. Everybody has some feeling or some expectation about what he or she himself or herself should do. Okay. Now, this approach has been very successful actually in practice, and Christina has led a very, uh, very uh, nice program in Africa to uh, help uh, prevent and uh, suppress. Uh, female genital mutilation based on these ideas. So that means that they are really applicable and they are part of the real world, okay? So I started doing things on, on that direction and that's again, a still a naive model, which I'm not going to discuss. But if, uh, for those of you who know uh, what reinforcement learning is, what you do there is treat the expectations as something that comes from uh, your reference group, okay? And that gave us, uh, the opportunity to start thinking about the model and how to explain experiment done by uh, these people. But I want to go further than that. And so this is what I'm going to uh, tell you about after this uh, background, which is uh, what we did on understanding social norms by measuring them. After all, I'm a physicist. I like to measure things. And that's what we did here. We ran an experiment and we measured social norms. Now, what's this experiment about? It's about something very timely these days. It's about the collective risk dilemma, which is a paradigm way to say uh, it's about climate change. It's about other things that affect everybody. And everybody should be taking action, but then they don't. So we will be discussing this. In fact, our approach to this uh, uh, problem comes from Manfred Wilinski introduced something he called climate gain that I'm going to explain in a sec uh, in order to model this uh, climate change problem and how people act in this uh, dilemma. So uh, what he did was introduce uh, this game. The game had 10 rounds. In his setup, there were six participants. Every one of them received four tokens. These tokens were later at the end of the game uh, transferred into money. So that's real money. And at every round, everybody could contribute zero, one, two, three, or four tokens. <clears throat> and the reach, the goal was to reach uh, 120 tokens among all at the end. So in other words, there were six people, 10 rounds. If everybody at every round contributes two, then the goal is reached. But of course, not everybody does the same. So that's what makes it interesting. And the goal is really important. If you reach the goal, everybody keeps whatever they didn't contribute, okay? So if I put two uh, tokens at every round, then I keep two tokens at every round. And that means that if we reach the goal, we keep it. But if we don't reach the goal, which is the equivalent of not preventing the climate change, then a catastrophe happens and everybody loses everything. And that's as simple as that, okay? The catastrophe occurs with some probability, and that's a plot from Manfred's original paper, uh, in which he showed in 2008, in, in, with experiments with real people, that if there was just a 10% or a 50% chance of this disaster, the groups didn't reach the goal. And even if there were a 90% probability of disaster, only half of the groups reached the goal. So that was really dramatic at the time. And okay, we have done this experiment later in 2016 or so, and things are somewhat better, but this is still a problem. So uh, we uh, went back to this game and wanted to see whether there are actually social norms playing a role there because nobody had looked into that. And to me, it's kind of uh, clear that if among a collective, some social norm arises as to how much money to put, then things could improve. Now, this was a real challenge because as we wanted these social norms to, uh, to really be social, we ran this experiment for 30 days. We had really very patient volunteers uh, and uh, well, they 
had the chance of uh, participating in a lottery at the end and getting a hundred euros. So, okay. But, but anyway, uh, we run this experiment daily. The difference with Manfred's setup is that instead of having 10 rounds, every day was a round. And then after every round, uh, after every game every day, we were uh, seeing how much money they made or whether there was a catastrophe or not. And then we reshuffle the groups. So everybody would be in touch with everybody at some point. And there were two groups of uh, 150 people, okay? Now here is, comes the thing. Uh, we uh, ask them about their expectations. And this is something kind of new in experimental work because so far people have been, studied, uh, have been studying uh, games in which you take some decisions and you get some money as a result. Now here we're asking about expectations, but we don't want to, this to be just a survey in which people answer randomly. So we pay them for their accuracy. So the process is we ask them at every round, how much are you contributing? This is this uh, screenshot here. But then we ask them, what are your personal normative beliefs? Of course, this cannot, we cannot check. I mean, they can say whatever. But we have these two data, decision and personal normative beliefs. So then we ask them about their empirical expectations. And let me remind you, empirical is what you think others will do. So we compare this with the decisions people took. And if you are accurate enough, you get extra money. Okay? And then we also ask them about their normative expectations. And this is what others think I should be doing. But we know that because we ask them about their personal normative beliefs. So I can compare again this with the info I have and pay them as a function of the accuracy. So it's not a survey, it's an experiment. And we are paying for the accuracy of the responses. Now, here's what happens in the end. And uh, what this plot says, don't worry too much about it, is uh, that uh, social norms evolve in time. Let me explain what's there. We ran two treatments. In the first one, they started with a very high risk of uh, catastrophe, meaning very high risk of losing everything if you don't reach the goal. And then at the middle of the experiment, they changed to lower risk. And we had the opposite treatment, start low, and then uh, uh, change to high. Uh, so the high-low treatment is the blue, the uh, low-high treatment is the pinkish. And uh, what you see, is that people reacted more in the case with high risk. And then the norm stayed more or less constant. Of course, it decays a bit, but the norm stays constant as uh, time progresses. Whereas in the low high treatment, people started low, but when the risk was increased, they immediately reacted to that. Now, what's really important here to me is that the norms drove the success of the groups. And this is the key plot about that. I'm plotting there the proportion of groups reaching the threshold as a function of the strength of the norm. I didn't say in my previous slide that the strength is measured by combining how uh, precise is the norm, how uh, narrow is the uh, window around it and all that. Details I can discuss uh, later with everybody that's interested. But here you see that the stronger the norm, meaning you have uh, to go to the right of this plot, the higher the success in reaching the threshold. So the norm is really doing something about reaching the threshold. And we also check that people were heterogeneous because now that we know that expectations are there, we can manipulate them. So we also ask them hypothetical questions about what would you do if people would contribute this much and they think you should contribute that much and what not. And we found that there were uh, people that would be affected by both types of expectations. So those are the green points in the, uh, in the plot there. So those people react to their expectations about others and also about what others think you should be doing. And then there's people who only uh, follow normative expectations, people who are uh, empirical cooperators, meaning they more or less copy what the others do. And then there's people that are unaffected by social norms. Now, this is interesting because if you remember, all these uh, ideas came to me from Nigel Gilbert's talk. He also insisted very much in the heterogeneity point, and that is important if you're going to use these ideas to uh, nudge people into uh, doing something uh, that's uh, socially good, because there will be people that react 
different kinds of expectations and people who won't react at all. And you have to take that into account. Okay. So uh, what we saw in this experiment and with they say closely part of the experiment is that basically uh, high catastrophe risk induces strong social norms, reduces tolerance to non-compliance because at the end we also asked them if they wanted to punish others that didn't uh, contribute. And so we can say that. And uh, the other important message from this slide is that we replicated the experiment. That's something that not, uh, is, is not always done. We replicated it during the COVID period and we found the same result. Basically, although there's uh, a little bit of a discrepancy in the uh, high low treatment, as you see in the plot on the right, uh, in the replication, the decay of the norm was faster than what we observed in the first experiment. But for the rest, most everything is replicated and we're still trying to identify the reason for this change. So, <clears throat> so can we do better? Meaning, can we be more quantitative <clears throat> in describing the relation between norms and behavior? And the answer is yes. So here uh, I have to refer to this uh, uh, reprint we are uh, working on. And it's based on this paper by Sergei Gabrilets that uh, proposes a model, a mathematical model, as to how actions and norms and beliefs evolve together. Okay, so this is really a mathematical model. Uh, Sergei loves to present it with this slide, which I'm guessing it's scaring you and it's, it scares me as well. But there's nothing here beyond second order emergence. So what this slide tells is that the behavior of people uh, is governed by this utility function. We value the result of our actions in terms of this utility function, which is the red uh, oval there. And that leads us to take decisions and produces a payoff for us. And then that feeds onto the group behavior, okay, the collective behavior. And that changes the beliefs and the attitudes of people back, okay? Because we see what others are doing. Perhaps we even have conversations with them and we learn what they think. And that again, translates into a number of factors that go back into the utility function. That's it. It's again, the collective behavior feeding back on the individual behavior. So in other words, the summary of the ideas here is that individuals care about their own material costs and benefits, of course, but they also <clears throat> want to do, they think what they think they, it's the right thing to do, observe and are influenced by others' behavior, don't like disapproval, and I think that everybody can relate to this, and they have to kind of deduce what people think from what they uh, do. And on top of that, there can be external influences like authorities and propaganda and uh, whatever. So when you put this in maps, and this is the uh, most scary uh, slide of this talk, I won't again discuss it in detail, but when you put this in maps, this is, ends up being a theory in which you have the utility uh, function on top. And this utility includes material payoffs, cognitive dissonance, which means I like to do what I think I should do, my personal normative belief, disapproval by peers. So if the others think I should do something and I do other things, that also is um, something I don't like very much. Conformity with what they do. This is empirical expectations. The previous one was normative expectations. And then you cannot see it because of this funny thing on top of the, all my slides, but there's the uh, conformity with authority that tells you should you should be doing this, okay? That leads to a prediction for the action that's uh, done there. And uh, the nice thing is that's linear, so we will be able to get it from the experiments in a more or less uh, statistically sound way. But then on top of that, we also have equations for the evolutions of the expectations, okay? So we have three equations that tell you how your personal normative beliefs uh, evolve and how the normative and empirical expectations evolve, okay? And we can uh, find all these uh, coefficients from the experiments. So in this case, we did another experiment and we used a, a little bit more complicated game proposed by uh, Elinor Ostrom, the Nobel uh, laureate in economics. 
Uh, she was an expert on collective action problems, and she proposed this game as being more realistic. And the idea is that in this uh, common pool resource game, which is the name of the game, the more you invest in principle, uh, the more you get back. But the thing is that the investments of everybody get together and they are uh, distributed according to what everybody put on. But then the function that uh, governs the productivity of the system is nonlinear. So at some point, the investments produce less and less. And hence this uh, set square term there. So you should invest that up to a point because later there is diminishing returns and it's not productive anymore to do it. However, if you invest a lot, you can get a lot if the others don't, because this is about the total amount of money invested again, okay? So this is a social dilemma because uh, for those who know a bit about game theory, Nash equilibrium of this game is uh, with our uh, parameters is 24. The Nash equilibrium is what economics predicts everybody should be doing. But the bad thing is that's bad for the society, meaning if everybody contributes 14, that's the maximum uh, earnings collectively. So I'm renouncing part of my individual earnings so everybody else is better off. So that's the, the dilemma, okay? And we also did an authority treatment in which we told them, look, the group beneficial contribution is 14 units. So here's what happens. What I'm plotting is the evolution in the experiment, which was again, in this case, it was 35 days uh, of our first, uh, the first plot is the actions. People begin like at uh, 15 or 16 or so in both treatments, the green and the red is with authority or without authority. So little by little, they move towards the NAS equilibrium. I mean, it's hard to tell whether they will reach it or not because our experiment, of course, has a limited time, but it looks like that. Then personal normative beliefs are uh, in the second plot and they eventually kind of get constant in time, more or less. With authority, they go a little bit down. It seems that the authority uh, goes into people's minds and uh, tells them, okay, you should be putting less money. However, it's interesting to see that people first plot, are putting more money than they think they should be putting, okay? Now they are accurate about their expectations about what others think, that's the third plot, but, and they are also accurate about the expectations of the behavior of the others, but look, the behavior in the fourth plot is uh, a little bit lower than the real actions because that comes from the info on the previous round, so that's a little bit of delay, and as you can see, the amount of money they make decays because they are moving the total amount of money decays because they are moving away from the socially optimum towards the Nash equilibrium, okay? So we are seeing that uh, these things are evolving together, but now with this data, we can also fit to every individual the coefficients of the theory. Now, this is very hard work, uh, statistically uh, done by Sergey and uh, Denise. And uh, here's what we see, this is, how much different things wait on us to take our decisions. And as you can see, material costs, which are uh, the coefficient B naught, it's like the second or third, no, sorry, the third or the fourth uh, factor. So the thing that we care most about is our own personal normative beliefs. This is B1, the coefficient B1 is cognitive dissonance, how much uh, things differ from what I think I should do. That's the most important factor in what we do. But then the conformity with the other sections, B3 is also important more than the material cost in the uh, case without messaging. It's less so, uh, sorry, it's even more so in the case with uh, authority. And then also normative expectations play a role about the same uh, importance as the material cost. So all these things are telling us that we indeed have a theory that tells us how our expectations about the collective behavior feed back on our decisions quantitatively, okay? So this is, uh, fits to the evolution equations. We can also uh, find them, but it's not what's most important here. So the main conclusion of uh, this part would be, indeed, we knew that, beyond economists, we knew that 
there's more to, to our decisions than material costs, but now we can quantify it and we can explicitly include the second order emergence phenomena, meaning our collective beliefs feedback on what we do. Now, in case you think, well, you did an experiment and you did that, well, that's very nice, but so what? Well, we fitted our previous experiment. Also, we tried to find the uh, values of the coefficients from those data, and that's what uh, I'm representing here. Uh, there is the CPR experiment I just told you about, the three coefficients, and then there are the four treatments we had, the first two for the climate change dilemma and then the replication. And as you can see, the results do not depend much on the game. You see that there is typically the same uh, type of uh, dependence. <clears throat> but then we did more. Uh, remember, I told you this takes 30 days or 35 days, and this is really demanding. In experimental terms, it's, it's, it's really the worst. So we said, okay, let's do it in 90 minutes and see what happens. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, it's not showing because I had to put this into PDF, so what I'm showing is not what I wanted to show. So uh, what you see on the... Uh, yeah, it's not there. So what you see on the blue lines on the left, on the right, is the result of the 90 minutes experiment. Interestingly, the actions and the dependence of the decisions on the expectations are more or less the same, but we find faster evolution in agreement with the thing, with the fact that they are doing that. And then my plot is not showing, but with the help of uh, Bo Yusang in Beijing, we ran this experiment, the CPR experiment, the Common Pool Resources experiment in, uh, with his students in China, and the results are also the same. There are, of course, a little bit of a difference here and there, which is probably idiosyncratic or due to culture, but the results are basically the same. So what we are saying is, I'm not saying it's universal, but at least the fact that so many experiments have the same behavior tells us that there's something really true about what I'm uh, telling to you. Okay? So there will be uh, more examples of that. I will be uh, talking briefly about this on the satellite on game theory and complex systems, about how this affects our choice of uh, buying an, auto an autonomous car or not. If you want to know more about that, I'll be there. Now, I have, I think I have uh, a little bit of time, so I very briefly want to give you my final example on second order emergence, and that is beyond social norms. That is how our culture feeds back on the social structure of our relationships. And this is uh, a paper that just uh, came out with these people there. So, uh, this uh, slide I borrowed from my co-worker, Jose Luis Molina, who is an anthropologist. Uh, I basically want to say that, again, this is a second order emergence problem. Uh, this is like the first part of uh, this feedback loop. There are cultural institutions that feedback on how we manage our relationships. But then, of course, if you go to the big picture, I don't try to understand very much like this, but if you go to the big picture, in the center you have what I just showed you, but the network is also changing what? Our reference group, the people who, talk, who we talk to, the people we go out with. So this change eventually feeds back onto culture and you have, again, your second order emergence loop. Okay? So that's the idea behind what we're doing. And we have data, thanks to, to Jose Luis, uh, on different uh, national uh, groups uh, in the USA and in Spain. And uh, here are the, the data. We left uh, some of the data out because, as you can see, there were very few to make a decent statistics. And we have data on their personal relationships. We ask them, well, they ask them to uh, name up to 45 uh, uh, relationships uh, together with how. Uh, they connect to each other. Uh, believe me, the field work anthropologists and sociologists do is really hard and good quality, and it may not be an awful lot of data, but it's ex excellent data. So with this data, uh, what we did was to uh, check a number of, uh, a number of uh, magnitudes that could be related to that. So we had structural measures of their networks, like network Quantities, most of the audience will be familiar with that, clustering, average degree, uh, closeness, assertivity, whatnot, and also group uh, variables. 
And what we found, if we plot the value of these variables for the different uh, nationalities, we find very different behaviors. And again, it seems to me that a uh, slide is gone because no, it's there. So the first one is about Argentinian people in the US, second one Dominican and so on and so forth. And those are the values of the quantities we look at. And as you can see, the different national groups are very different. And here I have to tell you, I'm taking nationality as a proxy for culture. Okay, so that's uh, of course uh, something a little bit uh, perhaps too much, but in any event, you see that the picture is very different. But in fact, we can predict the nationalities just by using this network data. And our accuracy is 50%. And now you tell me, well, that's flipping a coin. No, because we have to choose among six nationalities. So if you flip a coin or throw a dice, you, have to, you will be right only 16% of the time. So this is telling you that there's something uh, in the network that is encoding information about the nationality of these people and the, the, the group behavior. And this is another way to put it. This is uh, a very, uh, you have to be familiar with these plots to understand it. But basically, if you look at the first plot, for instance, for Argentinians, the way this is plotted, the red points means uh, it has a high influence. Blue points is has a low influence. If it's to the left, it's negative influence. If it's to the right, it's positive influence. So for instance, for Argentinians, the magnitude average degree has a negative influence on the fact of being Argentinian. So Argentinians typically will have less average degree than other groups. And so you see the different plots and you see that they are indeed different. If you think of this, this is one of these things that is like Duncan Watts book, everything is, uh, everything is obvious once you know the answer. Uh, of course, culture has to influence our relationships. We uh, hearing in, in Spain, we don't relate to each other much in the same way as people can be doing in, in Finland or in Senegal, or it's, it's obvious that things are going to change, that religion comes in, uh, the different roles played by men and women, and so on and so forth. So yes, indeed, they have to show on the relationships. So this is what I'm uh, putting in here, a summary of uh, what I just said. So we can really infer information about nationality, proxy for culture, with the structural network measures. Now. One thing we'd like to do, we have just recently shown in this uh, paper quoted below, which just appeared in scientific reports, that chimpanzees organize their social relationships like humans. And we have the strong belief that most primates will do the same thing. So one thing we are willing to do in the next future is the moment we have more data is to see if this is also true in terms of animal species, whether you are a chimpanzee or uh, you are a macaque can be to some extent predicted from there, or even among different groups, you can predict uh, whether you are in this group or in that group, okay? So there will be a further example of this feedback between uh, our decisions and the social structure. In this talk, I will be presenting also at another satellite. So it seems I didn't come to Palma for a holiday. And uh, if you want to know more about that, just uh, go there. So summary, summary is this. Second order emergence is a key feature, at least in social system. I'm guessing also in biological systems. Think of uh, quorum sensing in bacteria, for instance. And this, the whole point I want to make is that you can understand this theoretically, that you can have a mathematical model that quantitatively describes this and shows how the collective thing, particularly for the case of social norms, feeds back on our decisions. So uh, another take home message I want to insist upon, which I haven't explored a lot. I just uh, leave it for other uh, conferences of the complex system society in the future. There's a heterogeneity. So beware about making conclusions about the collective, okay? Because it can be that you see something on average that it's not true of any individual. So the relevance of this is about uh, using this to uh, promote socially good behavior or prevent socially bad behavior. If you don't take heterogeneity into account, you may be sending a message that will be heard by nobody. So another 
important uh, feature of understanding second order emergence is how to act on it. And heterogeneity is going to be a key point here. So you have to uh, take that into account. And with uh, that, uh, I want to uh, finish thanking again my uh, co-workers. I want to thank also Fundación Sicomoro for uh, supporting my talk and for their help with the conference. And uh, with that, I leave you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sancho, for this uh, <coughs> presentation. And uh, now we have some time for uh, questions, first here in the audience and then on the uh, online audience. So anyone willing to start with a question? Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, a question about the experiments, uh, all the things that people take into account uh, to act. Um, do you have an idea of how to take into account the fact that people would want to act in some way, but their own capacities or resources do not allow to do so, even knowing that this could have harmful uh, consequences? Yeah, um, I haven't uh, talked about this in uh, in this presentation, but we once did an experiment uh, with people in Barcelona in which we gave them different amounts of uh, resources to fight climate change. And it's very interesting what happens there because contrary to what you would expect, uh, in proportion to their resources, the people with less resources have contributed more. So it really seemed that they wanted to keep their money with their few resources and really the people to whom we gave more resources were piggybacking on them to keep them safe so indeed there's a lot of dependence this has not been explored in many experiments but what you're saying is obviously a possibility that people may have less resources and then not act but what we've seen in the, our experiment this was exactly the opposite thank you very much Thank you, Laura, for the question. Hi, Thank you very much. Um, my question is about the, the second bit, uh, the, the, the experiments over time. The way you presented the role of authority was a bit different to the other factors. Um, yeah. You didn't really tell us how much it matters. Uh, my question is that, was it a technical issue because you also mentioned the fitting is a bit difficult and also well how much does it matter well uh thanks so much taha for this question because it, it allows me to tell you about this uh, problem we the beginning uh, did fit and find the contribution of the authority but then we realized that our fits had in fact uh, what we were measuring was in terms of linear regressions the intercept or the slope and that was not informative because that included the response to the authority and any other idiosyncratic factors. So basically, the message is that we have to do experiments with other messages of the authority so we can uh, uh, separate the idiosyncratic effects from the effects of the different messages. And having done only one message, we cannot really tell you uh, how much is affecting. We can only say it has to be affecting because the other things change, but we cannot measure uh, how much. We believe it will be on the order of uh, empirical and normative expectations, but again, I cannot tell you nothing quantitatively sound. Hello, thank, hello. thank you very much for your illustrating talk. I was wondering, uh, have you ever thought about the possibility to uh, spot historical effects i mean uh how the system as it was continuing its state in the future well that's a very good question uh unfortunately i don't see how to do it without experiments because like i said going beyond 30 days or 35 days it's a lot uh a good point would be getting the same people again and do the experiment again at a later date but that's 
typically not feasible because most of these people are uh, students from the university or uh, and you cannot locate them then, then uh, later plus there is the anonymity thing that we don't keep records of who decided what so then we cannot compare so we could only be able if we were lucky to get part of the population back and we could only compare aggregates which would be informative i agree but that that would be really uh, a very nice nice experiment it's something that I'm not sure I'm willing to do. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question about the, in the climate game, somehow it's known the target they have to reach. There is a known target of yeah, yeah. We tell them everything. So, but like in reality, we often don't know what is the target we should reach. So, how this results or how this social norms theory changes in these uh, settings? We haven't looked at that yet. Uh, I have uh, co-workers that have looked at the effect of uh, uncertainty and ambiguity about the threshold in the climate game change uh, in the climate change game alone, and it does affect because there are people that are more risk averse and less risk averse. And then if uh, the threshold is uncertain, uh, then you see again this heterogeneity thing I was uh, discussing. But we haven't done anything, including social norms yet on that. But that's an excellent uh, suggestion. And that's something that I'd be willing to do. I have a question myself, <laughs> last one. Um, I mean, you've mentioned this uh, concept of second order emergence, which I like very much, and uh, uh, as a mechanism. Now, do you have any way to quantify what is the importance of this mechanism? Well, that's what I've tried to do with uh, fitting Sergei's theory to our experiments. We can there tell you the relative weights of uh, the collective effects, like expectations, as compared to just the individual effect of the material cost. So in this, game theoretical setup the answer is yes in general uh we would need to quantify what's uh, the equivalent of the material cost that's the individual uh the individual driver of your behavior and that's something i still don't know how to do but uh we believe we are starting to uh breaking through this problem thanks very much Ancho. we need to continue thanks very much for your presentation